I wanted to, um, I've got a number of questions about people um, refuse, you know, what do we do if someone refuses to be tested? Well, they can't now. If someone refuses in our um, facilities to be tested, they have to keep staying. So they won't be able to leave after 14 days. They have to stay on for another 14 days. So it's a pretty good incentive. You either get your tests done and make sure you're cleared or we will keep you in a facility longer so i think people most people will look at that and say i'll take the this i'll take feels the. like a glorified prison uh that is being um masqueraded as some kind of facility to protect the community from some kind of deadly plague and clearly it's it's not matching up I'm Sam Bailey and joining me on the show today is a very courageous individual, Mary Jane Newman, who is sharing her shocking experience of what happened in a New Zealand managed isolation and quarantine facility. Mary Jane, welcome. Not many of us know what it's like to be inside a quarantine facility, so I think a lot of the audience are going to be interested to hear your story about what happened to you. Did you have any idea of what the quarantine process was going to be like before you arrived into New Zealand? No, I, I just assumed that I was returning to New Zealand that I knew, the New Zealand that I loved with the friendly people and that it would all just be an easy, straightforward process. That's, that's what I just assumed um, because I, I first came to New Zealand in 2001 and it's been a country that I have made my second home because of the people, because of you know, the place and that's why I was choosing to return. Um, so I just didn't anticipate anything of what then started to happen. It was just a total surprise and shock to me. What was the reason behind you deciding to decline the PCR test? At the start of when all of this started to become uh, apparent in mainstream news, um, as a person who understands how the body works um, and as a person who has a great interest in health and well-being, I started to do my own sort of research around what what's this PCR test um, and why would something like that be necessary for discovering if someone has a virus. A respiratory virus and more so I was curious as to why it would need to be inserted up the nasal passage so far up the nasal passage and without even understanding it at that stage it was just red flags for me uh, so I continued to do some more research around what it was including looking up people like Kerry Mullins and discovered for myself that this was not a valid test. Um, I mean, from the perspective that I work from anyway within health, I was, it didn't feel like it was a valid test for me anyway. However, once I started to learn about it more myself, it became very apparent that this was a very unnecessary tool, but also a tool that was not fit for purpose. What happened when you first arrived in New Zealand? Yeah, this is when things started to really change. Um, I mean, when I first arrived in the country, it was it was also very apparent that the New Zealand I'd left was not the New Zealand I had returned to. When I arrived, um, uh, particularly in the facility that I was being um, quarantined in, which was the Sudima Hotel in Christchurch by the airport, you are given uh, uh, some paperwork that they ask you to complete once you've been shown to your room and I looked through the paperwork and uh, one of the pieces of paperwork was consenting to having everything that you are having delivered to the hotel searched. So yeah I was just like oh wow that's quite full on because this is my private things that I'm having delivered. If I want to have those things I need to consent to having my things searched and I wasn't going to be having anything strange delivered it was just going to be foodstuffs but still it is an invasion of my privacy however one of the other pieces of paper that you have to sign is consenting to have this this PCR test on day three and on day 12 of your stay um, and I just didn't sign the paperwork however one of the questions on there was do you have any questions about the test so I just said yes I have some questions that I would like to ask. And I left the rest of the page blank. 
I believe it was within 24 hours of handing back that paperwork that I started to receive um, knocks on my door asking me about why I was not consenting to the test. And I said, yes, I do have questions about this and I would be open to discussing alternatives uh, to testing me in that way. Uh, and I was met with, there are no alternatives in New Zealand. This is the only method and you have to consent to this or we will extend your stay in quarantine. What happened from that point? Perhaps what's pertinent to explain is that I had flown in from the other side of the world. I'd flown in from Ireland. So I had just undergone a, a long haul flight. So, you know, there's jet lag, there's, you know, adjustments to my circadian rhythm that need to happen. Um, so I had, a, I had landed in New Zealand at uh, two o'clock in the afternoon. I was awake pretty early in the morning and having not been outside for well over 24 hours, I wanted to get some fresh air. Um, I'd been shown to a room that had no opening windows um, and the expectation in quarantine is that you spend most of those initial 14 days inside that room and you are allowed to have uh, some time outside in, um, in a space that's guarded by the military. So at seven o'clock on the following morning, I was chomping at the bit to get outside and have some fresh air and just to be able to move myself um, outside. I took myself down to the exit where I could access this space uh, and was promptly stopped because I was wearing my own um, mask. Now I wasn't, I, I'm not a believer in wearing masks, but I felt, oh, I'll just toe the line, Mary Jane, um, and just wear a mask just to walk through the hotel corridor. Um, but I was stopped at the door and told that I couldn't exit the building to go outside to walk around a concrete yard, socially distanced from other people, unless I was wearing one of their, their issued masks. I said, well, what would be the purpose of me wearing a mask outside, uh, socially distancing from other people while I'm exercising? I said, that makes no sense from a health and well-being perspective to be wearing something that confines and restricts my breathing. Um, and they, they basically wouldn't entertain a conversation with me. And that was the end of me being able to go outside for, uh, for any kind of fresh air. I asked if I could be moved to a different room that had opening windows because because I said, you know, this is about supporting health and well-being by having us in here for 14 days. It makes sense that I at least have some fresh air rather than the air conditioning. Yeah. Uh, initially, they said, oh, that's not something that we can do in the hotel because that's managed by um, the managed isolation team. And I said, that's fine. I'll contact them. They, they replied to me and said, oh, that's a hotel issue. You need to deal with that in, within the hotel. So immediately there was this no one knows who's in charge of what kind of story unfolding for me. And eventually, just because I politely but firmly pushed the idea of being allowed to be in a room that had open windows or some access to fresh air, they moved me to a ground floor room that had a sliding door onto uh, a small green area and a bit of concrete, but I wasn't allowed into the green area. I was just allowed onto the concrete. It's in that room where I started to get questioned about not consenting to the PCR test. A friend of mine uh, agreed to bring me some uh, food to support me while I was in there. And I know that that was delivered at three o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, I was of the understanding that those items usually get delivered to you within the sort of 30 minutes, maximum an hour, because, you know, it's there's plenty of staff between uh, the medical staff and the military to be able to drop that sort of thing off. However, it didn't arrive. Uh, by this time, I'd also worked out when um, meal times happened and more or less how that system worked. For breakfast, they would just drop the breakfast bag outside your door um, and wouldn't knock because everyone has a different sleeping pattern. Some people are sleeping in later, some people are getting up early. So they didn't generally knock on your door. The, the bag would just be left outside your room. Who are the staff interacting with you? Is this the hotel staff? 
I never saw hotel staff you know as a general rule the only staff I'm seeing are medical staff which is predominantly nurses or I'm seeing the military so I'm seeing soldiers and then lunch would be dropped off you know approximately 12 30 1 o'clock and someone would knock on the door and say lunch and same for dinner it was usually around about six o'clock someone would come along and you could hear them coming along the corridor you know knocking on everyone's door and saying dinner so six o'clock came and um i could hear them coming along the corridor and i'm like awesome because i'm hungry i heard the trolley coming and going and nothing got dropped outside my door and i was like oh maybe maybe i made a mistake maybe it was another corridor and I just was a bit confused. Anyway, 6.30 came and still nothing outside my door. 7 o'clock came, still nothing outside my door. And by 7.30 I'm like, I'm really hungry. I haven't had my stuff delivered from my friend and I also haven't had my meal delivered for the evening. So I go outside my door and there's a soldier sitting outside my door now. I say to him, has dinner been delivered? And he says, yes, it has. And I said, uh, has my dinner been withheld? And he said, yes, it has. And I said, uh, and are you now outside my door to guard my door? And he said, yes, I am. I said, okay, uh, thanks. And I was so lost for words that I just walked back inside my room and I was just like, holy moly. I'm actually under a military guard and they're withholding my food. So they are punishing you? Yes, I was now being punished for refusing to be tested. Eventually someone comes at around eight o'clock in the evening. It's one nurse and she knocks on the door and just says nursing. And so I open the door and she hands me my evening meal. And I say, thank you. I can't recall exactly what she says now, but there was some reason as to why my meal was being withheld. And I'm just like, right? Because I'm so lost for words at what's actually happening that it's hard to even fathom a response to that kind of treatment. But I do manage to say, ah, oh, I'm interested to, to know where my delivery is because I know that I had something delivered at three o'clock this afternoon and it's now eight o'clock. Would it be any chance that I can have it please? Oh, we've just been really busy. Uh, we'll do our best to bring it down shortly. And I just say thanks. Um, anyway, it was 10 o'clock that night before I was finally given the delivery that my friend had dropped off seven hours earlier and their excuse was that they were busy. Now, for one, there was someone sitting outside my door doing nothing because I'm not a threat. You know, I'm, I'm an individual person staying in the room on my own. I'm, what am I going to do that's so threatening that I need a military guard outside my door? This is, this is not New Zealand. Uh, this feels like a glorified prison uh, that is being... Um, masqueraded as some kind of facility to protect the community from some kind of deadly plague. And clearly it's, it's not matching up. So that within the first 48 hours that um, all of this started to unfold around my non-consent for the PCR test. You're obviously very well. Yes. I have absolutely no symptoms um, and it was clear that I was a healthy individual. Um, my vitals each day that they took, because they come and take your blood pressure, they take your temperature and they take your heart rate every day. And uh, over the course of my stay, um, it was obvious that my vitals were, were great. In fact, I can quote, one of the nurses said, you are textbook perfect. What are the physical surroundings of the MIQ facility like? Does it, is it a little bit like a prison? Outside this room, I, it was probably very evident um, because I'm on the ground floor and uh, so I can see the fence outside the, the window of my room. And it's, it's a fence that's eight, 10 foot high. Um, and it's got a netting on it, so you really can't see through it easily. I mean, you can see beyond it, but it's, you know, the idea is, is that it, it, um, it creates some kind of visual shield. 
there's then another fence that's about 10 foot away from that. So it's a double fence sort of system uh, that has, was it exactly barbed wire? But there's some way to stop you from even climbing over the top of it. Um, and the fact that it's doubled, um, you know, there's sort of a double uh, way to stop you getting through really. And then uh, if I looked down this way along the, this grass, grassy area, there's, there's CCTV cameras, uh, which basically look all the way along that fence line, but also all the way along so they can see people who are in all of those rooms. So you, so you are being monitored 24 seven. What is the exercise area like? It was basically a concrete yard that has got this double fence all around it. People are walking around in circles, uh, socially distanced, with masks on, and all I can equate it to is that it looked like a prison yard, just exactly the way you see prisoners walking around in circles in their prison yard to get their daily exercise. And I, I'm not a prisoner, I'm not a number, and I will not you know, conform to being treated like that, just so that I can have some exercise and some fresh air outside. I've done nothing wrong and there's nothing wrong with me. It doesn't match up with what it is that they're apparently trying to do in terms of protecting the community from some virus. It just doesn't match up at all. Do they have ways of identifying you? that when you arrive they put a tag around your wrist now I don't know what kind of tag this is I don't know if it is just a plastic tag but to me I it was a blue tag to me I'm just like why do I need a tag around my wrist so as soon as I got into my room um, I took it off I, I used the, the butter knife that you get given you get given a knife a fork and a, a spoon and I just managed to cut it off my wrist because I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm not a number, I'm not a tagged individual and I refuse to be tagged in any way, shape or form. Um, they noticed that I wasn't wearing my blue wristband and they said, um, we, we noticed you're not wearing your blue wristband and I was like, yeah, that's right. And they said, well, why, why did you remove it? And I was like, well, what's the purpose of it? They said, well, so we can keep track of who's in the hotel. And I was like, so who else is in the hotel? I said, I thought that these were specific quarantine hotels for people. And so the only people that are here are people who are quarantining all the staff. I said, who else is here? And they said, oh, well, we have had some un, you know, uninvited guests come in. And I was like, really? I believe it was by the end of this, uh, what was maybe my second night in this, in this uh, room. By this time, like I said, I have a, a military guard outside my door, but I also notice beyond the fence, beyond the double fence, I hasten to add, that there's now a soldier that's also patrolling right outside the fence of my room on the outside. So I'm being watched from both sides in case I try to escape, I guess. <laughs> I would need some kind of pole vault to try and get out and and you know I generally don't carry a pole vault with me when I'm traveling and then what happened I received a phone call from one of the nursing staff saying there's going to be some people coming along uh, outside your room to put up some fencing and uh, I said for what purpose and she said well it's just to make sure that you don't try to leave uh, your room and you don't start to stray along any of that grass area but anyway what happened within five minutes is three soldiers and another member of the hotel staff came along and started erecting tape that basically said do not cross this line from a comedy perspective it looked like a, a crime scene to observe it happening outside my window it was a bit like one of those game shows where you're asked to try and achieve a task and these people have no idea about how to achieve the task um, to stop me from uh, escaping and to stop anyone from coming into this uh, danger zone of this person who uh, could have this deadly virus. However, what was even more hilarious about this was around about midnight, the sprinklers come on. So by the morning time, it was all on the ground and it actually looked just ridiculous. Um, but they had to be seen to be doing what they were told. What happened to you on day three? The uh, nursing staff come around and it's, it's testing day 
for the first round of the PCR test. And again, I'm asked if I would consent to having the test done. And I think it's also worth emphasizing, Sam, that I was always respectful, I was always polite, um, because at the end of the day, you know, these are people doing a job and there was absolutely no reason for me to be rude or disrespectful to these people. So I just said, no, I won't be consenting to that. However, what then happened after I again refused to, to consent was a nurse who I believe was one of the senior nurses within the team, a sergeant from the military and a police officer arrived at my door. So basically I was, I was given I was given a couple of choices. I, I consent to the PCR test, uh, and if I don't consent, then I, I get moved to a, another room in the hotel, which is even more confined, or I run the risk of being arrested and deported. In my head, I'm just like, holy moly, what is going on? Like what have I returned to here? This feels like communism. This feels like, you know, power and control, not protecting me or anyone else from something that is supposed to be deadly. You don't treat people like this when it comes to health and well-being. And this is the irony of the space I was in, Sam, because they have a health and well-being team as well as a nursing team. And yet my health and well-being was certainly not at the forefront of what was going on right now. It seems like it was deliberate intimidation with three people coming into your one room. Yeah, and I've got the soldier out one side and I've got another soldier out the other side. It is, it is deliberate uh, psychological bullying, to put it mildly. You know, it is, it's to create intimidation, it's to create vulnerability, it's to, it's to, it's to bully. So I just politely said, may I have some time just to think about your options? And uh, they said, yep, we'll be, we'll be back in 30 minutes. I gave it some thought. Uh, I spoke to a couple of people just to, you know, get some feedback on what I was sensing. Um, and I promptly packed up my things. I was, like, I was like, I'll move to this other room because I refuse to take this test because there's nothing wrong with me. So how many rooms have you been in by this point? Uh, so I'm about to be moved to my third room. They didn't return in 30 minutes. They returned, it was about two hours later. It was very, very clear from the energy of them that they were expecting some kind of altercation. Uh, because they were like, so what is your decision, Mary Jane? And I said, I'm good to go. I'm all packed. I'm ready. Where am I going? They were totally surprised by my answer because they weren't ready to move me in that moment. And they said, oh, you'll need to give us 10 minutes because uh, we need to clear the corridors. I did very well not to start laughing and uh, so anyway, I said, yep, no problem, I'll see you in 10 minutes. And it, it probably was about two hours later before they finally came. There was three soldiers that came and uh, that same nurse. And uh, the soldiers were going to move my uh, bigger pieces of luggage and I was to carry my smaller pieces of luggage. The nurse is dressed in full PPE from a face mask and uh, eye shields to uh, plastic uh, cape, booties, gloves, um, as I am promptly escorted along a couple of corridors in the hotel, uh, carrying some things in both of my hands, but I was reminded not to touch anything as I'm moving along the corridor, um, because it was so utterly ridiculous, um, the way I was now being treated, um, and being flanked by soldiers behind me and soldiers in front of me as well, and literally being marched along the corridors of the hotel to another part of the facility uh, where I was going to be isolated from, from anyone. So there's no one else in this part of the hotel. There's four rooms um, in this particular area. Uh, the only way to access it is by a staircase. I'm told that it's where they put people who've got COVID-19. So essentially you've been put into solitary confinement. 
I'm literally being put into solitary confinement, albeit a glorified hotel room. And I'm told that that's where I'll be and the only people I'm allowed to talk to are the nursing team who will come and see me each day. Uh, but I'm, I am reminded that it's got opening windows so I can have some fresh air, albeit on the first floor above the smoking area. Yeah. What happens after you've been put in solitary confinement? So uh, the next morning, bearing in mind, you know, this is still within the first couple of days of me arriving back from the other side of the world. Um, so I'm still waking probably at about three o'clock in the morning um, and awake for a couple of hours and then falling back to sleep around 5 a.m. So the next morning, it was, it was before seven o'clock in the morning and this really loud knock comes on my door and they yell, nursing, and I was fast asleep. And I can feel my heart racing uh, because of being startled from deep sleep. I call through the door saying, oh, you know, you've just woken me up. You know, can you come back? No, we're here to do your daily tests. Can you open the door, please? And I was like, but I'm not even dressed. Uh, put a dressing gown on. I was like, but, but I don't have a dressing gown. <laughs> you know, th those sorts of things aren't in the hotel room and I didn't have one in my luggage. Um, and they just said, we'll wait, get dressed. So uh, I'm just like, wow, you know, I, what is going on here? This is like, it's not even seven o'clock in the morning and I'm being woken from my deep sleep. I'm being demanded to open the door to do a, a, a temperature test, a heart rate test, blood pressure test. And my heart is absolutely thumping in my chest right now. And eventually I open the door. I said, you're not gonna get an accurate reading. We'll take that into account. Did you feel like this was a deliberate psychological tactic? So yeah, I did feel like this was a deliberate tactic to try and break me in some way so that I would comply to their demands. However, I was sure within myself that I was still doing the right thing. Did you have any symptoms? I had no symptoms, you know, because one of the things that they also do each day when they come and test you for your heart rate, your blood pressure and your uh, temperature is they ask you the same few questions, any symptoms. Do you have a sore throat? Do you have a runny nose? Do you have a cough? And I never ever did. I can't even remember the last time I've had symptoms like that. It seems that they're treating you like a leper. The moment that you touch anything that they deliver to you, um, it is considered contaminated. And so even if it is in packaging, so for example, one of the things that they delivered at one point was those little boxes of cereal that are inside a cardboard box, inside plastic. Now the moment that I I'm handed it, even if I don't physically touch it, it's considered contaminated, it goes straight into the bin. So there is an enormous amount of waste that is going on as well, uh, that is contributing to the astronomical cost of running this. At this point, who's guarding you in this red zone area? There's like a little sort of corridor space, which is not even 10 meters long. And then on the other side of that door is a soldier. Uh, so I still have that 24-7 when it comes to getting rid of my food rubbish. Um, there are bins along this corridor, um, but I'm told that I'm not even allowed to cross the corridor, which is, you know, no more than two meters. Uh, I just literally have to put it outside my door without crossing the threshold of the doorway. So the, every time I open my door, that person would see, am I abiding by the rules or am, or am I actually coming out of the room? Is there a regular schedule for when the nurses do their testing? No, no, nothing was regular about anything in that respect. Um, they would come and uh, knock on the door at, at random times. Uh, so sometimes it would be the morning uh, sometimes it would be late morning and sometimes it would be afternoon. There was never any consistency to what they were doing. Um, in fact, um, it might have been my second full day in this third room that they had come in the morning to do those checks and then they came in the afternoon to do it as well. And I said to them, for what purpose would you need to do them again when you did them in the morning? And 
I clearly have no symptoms and you know the results you got showed that I'm a healthy individual well because you're in quarantine now you're in the isolation area and we need to do it twice and I was like so why was it not done twice yesterday when I was here uh, and why was I not informed that you're going to do it twice if that is indeed even necessary um, and they said well, we'll have to find that out we don't we don't know the answer to that so they went away however they came back the next morning to do them again which I was just like yeah that's the daily one and then in the afternoon they phoned and said we won't be coming this afternoon to do your second lot of checks because you don't have any symptoms <laughs> and I'm like yeah I know so you know clearly I had already tripped them up on their own game their own I don't even want to call it a strategy because there was no strategy there was no rhyme or reason to what they were doing you mentioned before about identification tags did this come up again they said so we need to put another tag on you and I was like for what purpose would you need to do that well because you're now in quarantine so we need to put a red tag on you and I was like but why would I need a tag when I'm not allowed to cross the threshold of my doorway, so I'm not allowed out of the room. I said, you have someone guarding me at the end of the corridor, so I can't even get out of the corridor. I said, well, what's more? I said, you've just installed CCTV cameras right outside my window, so I can't even climb down the window if I was so inclined to even do that. I said, so no, I said, I won't be wearing your red tag. I said, because I'm not going anywhere. And they had no answer, Sam, because there was no reason. It can only be categorized as a prison, is a glorified prison. And they're wanting to tag me the way you would tag a prisoner. What are you doing, MJ, to psychologically cope with this situation? Yeah, don't get me wrong. This, was, this wasn't easy. Um, there were times when I, I questioned what I was doing because it was, it was definitely hard, you know. Uh, I, I understood what was going on. I understood that I was being psychologically bullied um, because, because of the nature of the work that I do, I understand these kinds of tactics. Um, so in order to look after myself, I really had to, you know, not that I didn't do it anyway, but I really had to start walking my own talk about the sort of things that I encourage people to do that I work with. Um, and one of the fundamentals of managing something like this is having a routine. I mean, routine is good for us anyway, um, but I knew that a routine was really going to help me. So uh, after that morning where they came and woke me up before seven o'clock in the morning, I was like, okay, I said, if you're gonna come at all of these random times, especially before seven o'clock in the morning, then I'm gonna get up earlier and I'm gonna be ready. So I started making sure I was going to bed at a decent time. I'm a practitioner of, of meditation, so I would make sure that I did that. In the mornings, I would do some kind of exercise. Um, I would, you know, listen to a podcast that was inspiring or motivating. I, I might do some reading. Generally, I didn't sit down and do a heap of reading um, because I found it quite difficult to focus on a book, to be honest. Sometimes I just needed peace and quiet. Um, because there was enough going on in my head with people coming and knocking on my door uh, and managing that side of thing. I don't know what made me think of it when I was packing my luggage, but I had also packed uh, a portable um, aromatherapy diffuser. Another thing that I did, because I love music, was sometimes, uh, you know, just to lighten things up a bit for myself, I would put on some music and I would have what I can only describe as a solo disco. <laughs> um, <laughs> just to, you know, just to keep myself light and just to bring a sense of, you know, different movement to what I was doing. Um, and um, just to inspire myself to know that I was, I was doing something that wasn't actually about me. This this was about standing for something that was greater than myself. This was about standing for something for all of us because we are being manipulated and controlled in a way that is not okay um, and is a fundamental infringement of our human rights to be able to choose how we operate and choose how we live our life and how we stand in that sovereignty as an individual. Did they tell you how long this confinement would go on for? 
I, I was told that um, I would have to stay in for, um, at this point, potentially 22 days because of not consenting to the PCR test. I was told that I would be able to speak to um, a doctor who was leading um, the COVID-19 response within the Canterbury District Health Board. Now this doctor, a female doctor, was not available to talk to uh, one of the uh, male doctors who was part of that COVID response within Canterbury District Health Board. And they phoned me on the hotel bedroom phone uh, rather than coming to see me face to face um, and started to ask me questions around why I was making the choices and decisions I was making. It was quite a condescending conversation I didn't feel like I was being respected or heard, to be honest. Essentially what they said to me, or what he said to me in that conversation was, uh, we will be keeping you in for at least 22 days now. Um, and I said, for what purpose would it be 22 days? And at that time I was told, that is the entire time frame for this particular virus from uh, first contracting it to its incubation period to it moving through the system and then being uh, out of the system is 22 days. And uh, I was like, oh, is that, is that so? Uh, because there's really, there's nothing you can say to someone that is of that belief. I was then issued with a letter informing me that my stay will be extended to 22 days because of not consenting to the PCR test. Were there any other red flags starting to crop up because of the stress? Given the circumstances that I'm in, uh, there is still a certain degree of stress going on. I also start to get a little bit suspicious they come and do these tests every day for the temperature, the heart rate and the blood pressure and they ask you the same questions about, you know, do you have any symptoms? Have you got a sore throat, a cough, a runny nose, etc, etc. However, I had a red flag go up when they asked me one day and continued to ask me on subsequent days if I had diarrhea. So I wasn't really sure why they would be asking me if, my, if I had diarrhea. So again, another sort of red flag started to go up for me around what are they doing to my food? Would the staff ask you questions? It was obvious to me that they, they were curious as to, as to how I was managing myself. They would ask me what I was doing in my room. I very politely would tell them, you know, I, I do yoga, I do meditation. I had a space between the doorway and the windows, which was approximately 10 paces. Um, and so I made it my mission each day to get in 10,000 steps as well, every single day. And that was part of me also just having a goal, having something to aim for. Again, it was about managing my own well-being while I was in there. <clears throat> and it got to the point, you know, with the nurses coming, that it was obvious that they were starting to get curious about how I was managing um, because one of them even said to me you know you're always so upbeat you're always so positive you're always so polite and you're always very very respectful what happened with your washing and laundry you're supposed to have um, you're supposed to be allowed to have some laundry done once in the first week and once in the second week um, but because I'm so uh, contagious or potentially a threat to the community, uh, they wouldn't touch any of my things. Um, so I had to do my own laundry. In your room? In my room, yeah. The rooms themselves um, have got, or at least the three that I was in, they have two uh, double, maybe queen size beds. Um, and what I would do was push both of them to the side so that there was a bigger space for me to do exercise um, and you know just create a sense of it not just being about sleeping within it um, so yeah they wouldn't do my laundry for me um, after the first seven days I I moved myself into the other double bed so that I could have some clean bed linen and then after 14 days, I asked if I could have some clean bed linen. Um, but again, they wouldn't even touch the bed linen. Uh, I was allowed to have clean bed linen, but they, um, when they dropped off the laundry bag for me to give them my uh, uh, used bed linen, uh, I was told I needed to put it into this plastic 
uh, bag which apparently disintegrates and then inside their hotel laundry bag um, so that so that there was a absolutely no way that anyone would be touching anything that I had touched. So you're on the countdown to your last day. What happened at this point? Do they tell you on your last day that you're allowed to leave? No, so what happened towards the end of, of the 22 days, given, you know, we're now approaching Christmas. So um, it's the 20th day. Actually, what I was actually told was we will review your case on the 22nd day. So it wasn't even official that I was going to be released on day 22, which would have been Christmas Eve. So on day 20, I contacted the nursing team. I'm just in touch to find out uh, that I will be leaving at two o'clock on Christmas Eve because uh, it will be Christmas Eve and I, you know, I want to arrange to be picked up because people are busy. The nursing team said, oh, we don't deal with that. You need to speak to wellbeing. So I said, okay, no problem. I'll phone the wellbeing team. So I phoned the wellbeing team and they said to me, no, 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 that's not our department. You need to speak to the nursing team. Said, so I've just spoken to them and they've told me that I need to speak to you and you're telling me I need to speak to them. I said, who do I speak to? Because clearly no one seems to know. So the girl in wellbeing said, leave it with me. We've got a meeting in an hour and I'll find out. Um, she came back to me after a couple of hours and said, look, we're really sorry. Nobody knows the answer. We'll get back to you tomorrow. So this is uh, the day before Christmas Eve. I still don't know if I'm going to be released and nobody actually knows. They call me in the morning and they said, we still don't know. We're trying to get hold of the, the doctor who's heading up CDHB for the COVID response. And um, we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, I speak to the nurses when they come to do my daily checks. They still have no answer. Um, I speak to them at lunchtime when they drop off my lunch, still no answer. I speak to them again when they drop off my evening meal, still no answer. Uh, I believe it was about 6, 6.30 in the evening when one of the nurses finally calls me and the nurse says to me, uh, so can you confirm what time you arrived? Now what's important to remember here is when you arrive, they have every single piece of paperwork that they can possibly have on you. They know what flight you came in on, they know what time you arrived because the time you touch down is the time that you officially can leave the facility because it's about, she touched down at two o'clock and so she can leave, you know, from that two o'clock onwards, it's 24 hours, 24 hours, 24 hours, which makes up the 14 days. And then, so she's like, so what time did you arrive? And I'm like, I arrived at two o'clock, like it says on my paperwork. Uh, and, um, and which airport did you arrive into? She said, was it Auckland? And I was like, no, I flew into Christchurch. And she said, okay, um, okay, I'll give you a call back. So she then goes away and then eventually comes back to me and says, yep, yep, we can let you leave uh, at two o'clock on Christmas Eve, on the 24th of December. And that, that would have been me doing 22 days. So uh, on that final day, on Christmas Eve, I didn't see anyone in the morning. Um, it was, I think, just before midday or around about midday, two nurses came to my door. Bearing in mind, I'm about to be released in a couple of hours. And they came to my door, still dressed in PPE to do daily checks and I was like so f you know why would you be doing these when I'm about to walk out of here and they're like oh we need to do them within three hours of you leaving just for the record and I'm like and what if they're different um, and they said to me oh you know at two o'clock um, you know make sure you call reception and someone will be sent up to um, help you carry down your luggage and I said I, I don't need any help to bring down my luggage. I said, I'm more than capable of moving my own things. It's fine. And they said, no, please, please phone reception. She said, because the soldiers need something to do. <laughs> um, so, so I phoned them at, at two o'clock and I just said, right, I'm ready to go. And uh, they said, yep, no problem. We'll send a soldier up for you to help bring down your things. And I promptly, um, started to just move my things out into the hallway outside my door, at which point the person who's, you know, on duty at that particular point guarding 
my corridor, because I was still the only person in that space, promptly opens the door. Don't move. You have to wait until someone comes up. And I said, it's okay. I said, I'm not moving. I said, I'm just moving my bags outside my room. I've already phoned somebody. There's a soldier on the way to help me. After spending 22 days locked up in, in a room and I was about to pull some stunt to, you know, to, to ruin my chances of walking out at that stage. And this person just went nuts at me. Anyway, thankfully the person who did come up um, was a very friendly, very helpful member of the, the military team that were there. Um, and as we walked down through the hotel corridors, he was asking me some questions about my time. And it became very apparent very, very quickly that he and probably most other people had absolutely no idea that I had been kept in that room without being able to go outside for the entirety of my time in there. Because he said to me when I described it, he said, that's solitary confinement that you've been kept in. And I was like, I know. He said, I thought you were allowed outside, you know, escorted with, with a soldier. And I was like, no, I said, I haven't been allowed outside since I arrived. I said, I wasn't allowed to cross the threshold of my doorway. And he's like, wow, he said, that is solitary confinement. He said, we don't even do that in our military training. And I was like, I know. Whoever was calling the shots on this, most of the other people in there had absolutely no idea about what was going on. And once I arrived into the reception part of the hotel, there was at least maybe half a dozen other soldiers who were lined up waiting, it felt like, to see who this person was that had been in this room that they clearly had heard about but not seen because I wasn't allowed out. Um, and members of the hotel staff, you know, <clears throat> approached me and were like, Merry Christmas, Mary Jane, and I had no idea who they were. It was just the most surreal experience as I left the facility. I'd gone from this person who needed to be quarantined in a room you know, that had to be guarded to all of a sudden almost feeling like some kind of pseudo celebrity status. Um, not that it, not that I felt like a celebrity, but it was just all of a sudden I was just this thing that was on show. Here she is, she's the one. It felt just weird and odd and sick in some way. Um, it's just like, yeah, this is the one that we've punished. Mm -hmm. Here she is, you know. She, hasn't she done well? It was almost like they were there to congratulate you in some bizarre... Experiment. Experiment of, oh, you know, she got through. I said to that soldier outside, you know, do you enjoy your work? And he said, yes, yes, I do. And I said, you know, never ever lose what's inside here. I said, never ever lose your sense of self. Carry on enjoying what you enjoy about this. I said, but never lose that that independent part of yourself, mm -hmm. because it's so important. There was one quote by Holocaust survivor, Viktor Frankl, that got Mary Jane through her ordeal that she wanted to share with you, which is, everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. To help sustain my channel in this time of censorship, please support my work on Subscribestar. Link is in the description. Um, we will share with you the most up-to-date information daily. You can trust us as a source of that information. Uh, you can also trust the Director General of Health and the Ministry of Health. For that information, do feel free to visit at any time to clarify any rumour you may hear, covid19.govt.nz. Otherwise, dismiss anything else. We will continue to be your single source of truth. We will provide information frequently. We will share everything we can, uh, everything you are, else you see, 
um, a grain of salt. Uh, and so I really ask people to focus the on that. The most egregious example of that appears to be this text which originated in Malaysia and has kind of a, has become a viral hoax in Australia and in New Zealand. How irresponsible is it the people that are sharing that news of a lockdown imminent in New Zealand? Yeah, and, and look, that's the kind of thing that adds um, to the anxiety that people feel. So I continue to share the message. New Zealanders must prepare. But do not panic. Prepare. And, and when you see those messages, remember that unless you hear it from us, um, it is not the truth. And I really ask people, just visit um, uh, covid19.govt.nz. It has all of the up-to-date information. And we will continue to provide everything you need to know.